Uh, coming to America, that uh, is a story in itself. My father felt I should, after I studied in, in Berlin, I should uh, leave Europe for a while, and uh, then I uh, came here for one year in 1957 first uh, to France, German American friends in uh, Durham, near Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, uh, one day uh, I got a, a call uh, of uh, Dr. Val uh, Dr. Wilhelm Reinhold Valentina, the great Rembrandt Authority and uh, also father-in-law of Harry Bertoria. I, I had never heard of Bertoria in all these former years. It was all new to me. Not even did I know Dr. Valentina. Valentina is a, a monument of modern and ancient art. He, he bought for America a hundred Rembrandts. When we arrived here in Pennsylvania, Bertoria was in pretty bad need of help, and he hired me on the spot and we worked for half a year together on uh, an exhibition for uh, Don Hatch, uh, a gallerist in uh, Caracas, Venezuela, South America. Uh, this was a very uh, eventful time and we did uh, quite a lot of new pieces together, large and small, all, all in metals, not in wood or stone. What did you take from your experience with working with Harry in Yeah, in that, that was uh, uh, quite very significant for me because the years I worked with Hans Ullmann, who is a constructivist, very precise work, like Max Bill and others. Uh, uh, Bertoria's work impressed me as being very free hmm. and uh, very poetic too and uh, uh, kind of different to what I did in Europe. Right. I started making landscapes, which uh, are visible here in this room, uh, mostly in bronze. I did not work in, in, in Germany in bronze. I, I didn't have these metals. Those I all uh, <clears throat> was uh, uh, finding in Bertoria's studio, and he told me how to use them and so on. Oh. Right. What materials did you use? It was mostly a, a metal, which is very fine, so-called phosphorus bronze. Right. And the phosphor bronze is a metal which uh, is not only very expensive, but everlasting. You could call it also a bell bronze. Has, uh, they usually have wonderful sounds, you know, right. all these objects here. Right. And Bertoria explored that even more because he really went uh, made uh, these sounding sound objects, which uh, I call them the singing wires, and uh, uh, they're very successful now. Not during his lifetime, uh, he uh, sold some, but not all of them. So the the var great varieties of his work always impressed me, and uh, also his wonderful graphics, which are today still pretty much unknown in the art world, and uh, totally under underestimated. I think Bertoria's graphics, these monographics, all printed, uh, designed on Japanese rice paper, they are, I would think, some of the very best of the 20th century graphic arts, almost like, uh, like Paul Klee's work. What did you learn from him, and, oh, and how, did, how did it sort of impact your own, your own work? Especially how to weld, you know, weld, weld, the welding, the torch, acetylene and, and oxygen, these two gases combined give three and a half thousand degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, I really learned from the, from the bottom up how to weld. And uh, I didn't have a chance in doing that in Europe. We were very limited after the war. Uh, we had only one welding outfit for oh, 12 students there. And uh, later on, I was very fortunate that I had my own studio at the academy, which was, uh, I was very envied. By, by the rest of the students there because he never heard of that. Plus, I was very young. When I started studying at the academy, I was 16 years old. Uh, you have to be actually, to be admitted, 18 years old. But uh, the professor thought pretty good, and uh, I didn't think so. But uh, <laughs> they, uh, they let me uh, come in early. And I was uh, done when I was 23 that I came to America. Tell me about your uh, one of your big commissions uh, in, oh, yeah. well, in New York. How, how did that happen? That happened because Bertoria 
received so many commissions that he said one day, I came into his office, he said, I have 20, 20 commissions to do. That was far too much. Not even in a year you can do that. And uh, they were usually very large, you know, enormous sculptures. And uh, some we did together in, in the later years. But there were two other men helping, uh, welders from, from Allentown, two Irishmen, the Flanagan brothers. They, uh, one, one died, one is still alive. Yeah, they were expert uh, welders. They would uh, especially uh, make all these sculptures for Victoria in parts uh, when it came to these uh, bushes or trees. And uh, other, uh, I helped coating this enormous amount of steel wires with pliers uh, for for these large commissions for Yamas was it Yamasaki, I think, uh, life insurance bu building a stolid sunlit straw, it's called. Uh, they are very large uh, commissioned works, which took months to do. The commission started when I came back to America in 1959-60. Petoya sent me a large check and a nice handwritten letter. He says, I need you again. We have a very large commission by Union Carbide. They want 20 large pieces. and." Uh, so he sent me uh, an invitation and also a large sum of money to finance my trip back to America. I brought a lot of my uh, finished works also uh, with me on the ship. And uh, he came personally, uh, it was shortly before Christmas in 1959, to New York to pick me up in, on the pier, 84. There we were and uh, there he was. and. Uh, and where was his studio at the time? The studio was here in Bali. In Bali. Bali in Barto, Pennsylvania, yeah, right, right on Route 100. Right. Uh, and uh, it started right away. Uh, the, after Christmas, we, we went back to work and uh, big commissions came in, many. Right. What about the emigrant bank commission oh, that, yeah. that, you, that you did? Yeah, one evening he called me, said, Klaus, I have uh, uh, another commission, the Amagon Savings Bank in Manhattan, asked me to ask Harry to do a large sculpture for a huge wall, with 250 feet long and 20, 30 feet up, white marble wall, beautiful, and uh, went through the whole block from 40th to 41st Street. And uh, But then Batoya told me they would like to have a boat filled with immigrants going to America. <laughs> he didn't like to do that. So he said, it's up to you what you propose to them. Uh, two days later, I went to New York. I saw the model of the wall, and uh, they, I asked for a piece of gold paper and a scissors. I cut out 21 of, uh, miniature suns, and uh, I told them this could, these could be gold dollars, or but, but for me they were actually heavenly bodies, uh, large uh, suns, Peruvian gold objects or things like that. Right. And uh, they were very impressed and they, uh, I left the bank with a very large check to, to start buying eight tons of metals. It took actually two years to make this entire piece. Uh, the entire commission was taking very long. Right. Uh, it's now permanently installed in, on that white marble wall in New York. It's the largest thing I ever did. What about your own uh, career as an artist, um, showing at local universities and, yeah. uh, and in the New York Gallery? Yes. Um, tell me a little bit about, about those years that, as well. That is, uh, I can say a lot about that because uh, I wasn't very long here when the door opened and George W. Stemfley came, a Swiss gallery owner from Manhattan, a uh, very wealthy man. He had married a woman of terrific wealth from the uh, McFadden family from Philadelphia who gave enormous artworks to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And uh, she was uh, the one who financially backed his gallery they were so wealthy they could buy Picassos and uh, whatever. You know. 
And uh, when George Stanley came to visit Victoria, I, I was happened. I happened to be present in the studio, so Harry introduced me to George Stemfley. And at that time, I had a small exhibition at Kutztown State College, which is a university now. And uh, he, he liked my work. He bought five pieces for $1,000. I, I quote sometimes these uh, figures because today they seem to be nothing, you know, very, very low. But $1,000 was maybe like 10000 today. Mm -hmm. And uh, he bought these five sculptures out of my show in Kutztown. And uh, two or three weeks later, he called and said, I sold them already, uh, uh, already all of them, and uh, we need more. And how about making an exhibition for us, a one-man show, which I did. So this would have been the early 1960s yeah. at, the, at this point? 1960. And then uh, a little in 62, the Hirschhorn Museum showed close to 200 uh, works of the Hirschhorn collection. I was happy to be in there with a golden cube hanging downstairs in the rotunda in the Guggenheim. Uh, that all happened in these two first years being here in America. You must have been starstruck and... It was very amazing how... <laughs> And, and later in life, it was not that busy anymore. It was very calm again, you know, right. up till now. Right. What would you like your, uh, your artistic legacy to be uh, f for all time? What, what, what is your, uh, what's works, your desire? The works themselves, as you see them here and everywhere, speak for themselves, you know. Uh, what will happen to it all once we are gone, all of us, uh, it's uh, beyond me. Uh, it can can go very high. It might never be discovered. We don't know. Well, Klaus, we really appreciate you taking the time to chat oh, yes. with us today about your career as an artist, yeah. your time with Harry, and yeah. uh, and the legacy of There's your work. There's so much more. I wish I could really open up and tell you what it all was. Uh, what you hear today is not very much, you know. But Toya was a wide open, wonderful man, very very kind and and giving. Uh, you don't meet people like this too often.